encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. Chapter 15 and verse 20. The first thing we do when we think about a message at our church is to open God's Word and let God's Word speak to us. That's what we're going to do this morning on Resurrection Sunday. We're going to let God's Word define the joy we should have in this event. And in particular, as we read this small section of Scripture, I want us to be aware that God is a rejoicing and joyful God. God is a God full of joy, and he, he places sections in his word that are specifically designed to elicit joy and celebration. And this is one of those sections. So let's, let's be prepared to enjoy our rejoicing God as he speaks his word to us. This is God's word, authoritative, joy-filled, and spoken to us. We're going to begin reading in verse 19 for context, but our focus is just going to be on verses 20, 21, and 22. Let's begin reading 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. On September 2nd, 1945, World War II concluded. It's almost impossible for any person younger than 80 to appreciate the joy that exploded around the country and even around the world at the declaration that the war had been brought to an end. The dead of that war and in the countries involved rose above 70 million people. Those who were meant to live long lives were cut down in death at young ages. For years, death had accompanied every newspaper released with a list of casualties. As long as that war lasted, the world looked to the future and saw death. But then, suddenly and triumphantly, the war was over, and the violent march of death would come to an end. In New York City, two million people crowded into the streets to celebrate. As Life magazine said at the time, it was as if joy had been rationed and saved up for three years. It was as if joy had been rationed and saved up for three years. So we can all appreciate the joy of knowing that the carnage and the acceleration of death that war had brought had been brought to an end. The relief that would race through the hearts of mothers and sisters and fathers and brothers of those in uniform who did not know whether they would make it to their 30th birthday. But the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, it intends to give us an even better announcement. It intends to give us an even more profound joy than what was present on September 2nd, 1945. The Bible does not view only premature death or violent death as a great tragedy, but death itself. It views not just casualty lists, but obituaries and graveyards as an atrocious enemy. It must be defeated according to God's word. It views joy as being rationed not just because of battles, 
but because of burials, not just because of bombs, but because of heart attacks and car crashes and overdoses. The Bible intends to unleash a deathless joy. Even the best joy humans can concoct comes when death is merely delayed. But the Bible wants to issue a different kind of announcement. It wants to issue an announcement that death has been reversed. Not just delayed, but defeated. And that's Paul's goal in this passage. He wants to make an announcement, and he wants joy to be unleashed. He wants hope to be unleashed. He wants the joy that has been rationed to the ordinary highs of this life to be unleashed because death itself is not just deleted or delayed, it is defeated. The resurrection of Christ invites us to eternal joy because he gives eternal life in him. It invites us to an eternal joy because eternal life has been given in him. It invites us to that joy. That's what this passage does. Now, he gets there by making three connected statements. Three connected statements. We might call them the fact, the pattern, and the guarantee. The fact, the pattern, and the guarantee. Let's walk through these statements, and I want to make a personal appeal. That that as Paul lines up these announcements, one after the other, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to unleash the joy that the Bible intends to give you at these amazing words. Let's start looking at the fact. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul is providing a fact. The Corinthian believers, at least some of them, had come to the idea that there was no bodily resurrection. They were a very pagan city, and probably they had been influenced by the pagan thinking of the Greek culture, that the body was somehow denigrated, the spirit was more valuable, and probably there was not going to be any kind of resurrection at the end. You lived for this life in the flesh, and then that flesh life was over when you died. Paul says that is not the case. He's just been telling them how much of a devastating blow that would be to every other aspect of Christianity, how worthless it would be for him to be laboring for the gospel and suffering for the sake of Christ, how worthless it would be for them to have hope in Christ if it is merely a religious idea to carry them along from one year to the next. He says, no! But he says, aside from any argument or philosophical argument, the the point is there is a fact that has to be considered. There is a fact that refutes the idea that this life is all there is. And that fact is Christ is alive. In fact, Paul says, Christ has been raised from the dead. It is a fact. Paul counts it as a we might call it a scientific, a physical reality that Jesus Christ, having been crucified on a Roman cross, having expired, his heart ceased to beat, his lungs ceased to breathe, his brain ceased to work. He was there in a tomb, dead, a corpse, a literal corpse, for Friday night, all of Saturday, until Sunday morning, and then suddenly his heart started to beat, his lungs started to breathe, his brain started to work, and he was alive again. He says, this was a fact. And he says, I can and testify to this because I have seen him. He says earlier in verse 8, he's listing all of the people that were eyewitnesses of the living physical Christ. And he makes very clear, as the Gospels do, this was not merely a spiritual vision. This wasn't a picture of Jesus that came into their head. No, this was seeing the embodied Christ after he had been killed on the cross and had been dead for so long that this was not any mere resuscitation. This was a resurrection. This was a life after death. And he says, I've I've seen him. I have seen him. This is a fact. He stands in court before the Corinthians and he lays his hand on the Bible and literally declares, before God, I declare, I have seen the risen Jesus Christ bodily alive. It is a fact. Now, this is very important to us because we live in an age where, interestingly, spirituality is becoming more popular again. Have you noticed that? 
when I was, was growing up, spirituality was kind of ignored, and there were some you know, weirdos who were into Jesus back in the 70s, and some people thought that was interesting, and other people had religion as a sort of a prop uh, for their everyday lives, but, but it wasn't really cool to be spiritual. It was cool to be scientific. It was cool to be practical. And yet, now, there's a growing appreciation for being in touch with the spiritual side of things. Well, interestingly, the Bible doesn't present Christianity as a merely spiritual experience. It presents it as having physical facts to deal with, to confront. Jesus rising from the dead is not a nice religious thought or an interesting cool hero story or a nice uh, Marvel Avengers-like magical power that we can talk about and watch on the screen. No, this is a, a scientific fact. Jesus was as dead as any person in a morgue in Round Rock this morning. He was as dead as any person in the grave of those graveyards that surround and dot this area. He was just as dead as any of those people. And on Sunday, he was just as alive as anyone sitting right here. He was physically alive. His lungs were breathing. His heart was beating. His brain was working. His nerves were feeling. He was alive after being just as dead as any dead person that is dead anywhere in this creation. And Paul says this is a fact. This is a fact I, I read a story this week of a man who fled his home and he returned 19 years later to find that he had been legally declared dead. And I can only imagine the irony in the courtroom when the judge who was given his case, he, he tried to get a driver's license and found that was very difficult being dead. And the judge was given his case and he, I'm sure he tried to take his job seriously. You have a declared dead man and as he said it, what we've got is the obvious here. We've got the obvious. A man sitting in the courtroom appears to be in good health. That's how Paul would say it. He'd say it, Jesus is alive. It's a fact. It's a physical fact. Whatever you might want to think about resurrection, I can prove that resurrection takes place because Jesus is alive. And interestingly, Paul doesn't just say it's a fact for Jesus alone. He makes a startling claim. Look down at your Bibles. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So these Corinthians knew Christian brothers and sisters over the decades since the church had been established that had died. And what Paul claims is that the fact of Jesus' resurrection is not a one-of-a-kind event. It's the first in a series. So uh, imagine a, an orange grove. And imagine that the harvester goes out when it's time for harvest, and he sees a, a beautiful, ripe orange. And he, he gathers it, and he takes it, and look, look what I found. It's the first fruit of the harvest. Now, that man's joy is not only based on that one orange, is it? No, it's, it's based on the fact that this is an indication that all of those other oranges are about to be ripe as well. And they can be harvested as well. That's the idea, that's the logic that Paul is putting forward here. He's saying the fact of Jesus' life is a fact of the beginning of a harvest of life after death. This is the fact, Paul declares. This is his declaration. And, and it's important. He's going to move forward into his logic, but we just need to pause for a moment and, and settle in to the reality that this means for us as Christians. This means that Jesus Christ, the Jewish man who walked around Jerusalem and Galilee 2,000 years ago, who was crucified on the Roman cross, expired, is currently alive. He's physically alive, not just spiritually, physically. There is a human being in heaven, a man named Jesus Christ. By the Spirit of God, he is listening to our songs. He is right now hearing his own word preached. He is with us 
through his spirit, but he is physically alive. You, church, do not serve and love an idea. You don't serve a martyr whose teachings have helped you in your life. You don't follow a religious pattern. No, you serve a living person who knows you, who watches you, who, as he promised, would never leave you or forsake you, who is physically and truly alive. He is alive every morning that you wake up. He was alive all night long while you were sleeping. He is alive when you are suffering. He is alive when you are sinning. He is alive when you are confessing. He is alive when you are with your family, when you are alone. He's alive when you're at work. He's alive when you're in the hospital. He's alive when you're on your deathbed. He is alive. This is the fact that Paul is declaring to the Corinthians. No, Corinthians, he says. This life is not all there is. You are not merely to eat, drink, and have fun. No, you are going to face a living Savior. And all those Christians who believe in him, they will be alive as well. Now, Paul views this as a fact. It's not a religious opinion or wishful thinking. But he also understands that his readers and us would want to know what this has to do with anyone else. I mean, no one could deny that Jesus was special. There just were not very many people casting out demons and raising the dead. There weren't that many people doing that. So you could think, well, obviously I could see God raising Jesus. He's an awful special person. But what does this have to do with anyone else? What does this have to do with the death I see every day around me? What does it have to do with that? And that leads Paul to his second point, the pattern. The pattern. For, Paul says, for, an important word, as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. As by a man came death, By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Paul intends to communicate that Christ rising from the dead and bringing life after death into the experience of this world is following a pattern that had happened before. Right now, death feels like a normal part of life in this world. Uh, Before coming to the building this morning, Uh, just because of the morning that it was, I went by uh, the graveyard that's up at Westinghouse. And I just parked and I just just walked around just for a couple of minutes and looked at the names on the graves. It is the most natural thing right now in the world to see a graveyard. Mothers and fathers, there's soldiers there who fought in World War I, there's family plots, presumably husband and wife, next to each other. Death is a, a, a normal part, a regular, almost a, a, an obvious part of life. And so we could miss the profound statement that Paul is making in verse 21. Look down your Bibles. I want you to notice a very, very important phrase. As by a man came death. Death, as obvious and normal as it seems right now, was not natural to this creation at the beginning. At the beginning, for people to die was the most unnatural thing that could happen. And then a man, and Paul makes it clear he's talking about Adam, sinned and rejected God's life-giving offer. And into the world came the consequences of sin, death. As by a man came death. Paul's referring clearly to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, where the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. This is the major reason why the fifth chapter of Genesis reads like a multi-generational obituary. Eight times in that chapter we read the words, And he died. We think of it as normal because we're now thousands of years removed and everyone dies. 
But God was making a profound statement about the truthfulness of his word. He had declared that if you sin, you will die. You will die spiritually, you will die physically. And chapter 5 makes it clear God always does what he says he will do. They had sinned, they had rejected the life-giving God, and death came definitely as a result. And he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. And chapter 5 is followed by chapter 6, where there's that overwhelmingly destructive flood. And all that breathed the breath of life, it says, were destroyed, except for Noah and his family. The point of chapter 5 and 6 in Genesis is to make very, very clear that by a man came what? Death. It was not natural to God's creation. It was not original. It wasn't as though God created death on the eighth day and he saw that it was good. No, God declared, if you reject me, you will die. And chapter 5 and 6 of Genesis make it very clear that death is automatically the inheritance that humankind has because of Adam. As by a man came death. But notice what Paul does. Notice. He says that in the same way that a man introduced death into God's creation, a man will now bring about or bring in the resurrection of the dead. You know how in a mirror you see your reflection, but you see it reversed? You know that's true? Have you ever seen yourself like a, in a camera? And you, well, you think, wait, that's not, that, I don't part my hair on that side. Have you ever had that experience? That, that's not where that mole is. Where, where, why is that happening? Right? Have you ever, you ever had that experience? Because it reverses the image. That's, that's the logic Paul is using here. He's saying, look, there's an there's a exact reflection in reverse. Adam brought death because of sin, and Christ brings life because of his death. For as by a man came death, so also by a man has come the resurrection from the dead. What Paul is saying here is that death and all these tragedies that are not original to creation were merely a consequence of Adam's sin. But like Adam, but in an ultimate reversal, Christ introduces life beyond death back into the world. There was now a way in this world where life after death that God had first given to men and women could be seen and observed. The, the Bible reviews this. It's, it's a beautifully crafted plan if you have ears to hear. The Bible tells of a great tragedy when Adam rejected a life-giving God and suffered the consequences consequences of death for all those that belong to him. But then God sends another man who will be a, a bringer of something transformative into the world. And he, instead of bringing death, brings life after death. So Paul is saying, look, it, it, is, it is not odd or unusual that one man could have such a profound existential impact on the world. It's not unusual. It happened with Adam. He's saying, remember, Adam, this has happened before. One man brought death out of life. And now God is reversing the process. One man will bring life out of death. He's saying, this is just God doing what he always does. God declared that sin would result in death, and it did. And God has declared that life would follow the death of Christ, and it did. Jesus' life was having an impact beyond his own resurrection, and it's a pattern. The negative of that pattern is seen in every graveyard and every battlefield and every hospital ICU. But the positive of the pattern is seen in Christ, who rose from the dead never to die again. The pattern of birth, life, and then death has now been interrupted. There is a new man who has brought new hope into the world. And yet, we still need more for this to be good news for you and me. What if this pathway out of death is present in the world, but hidden from us? Or, or it could not be known or experienced. What if, if Jesus was simply the new creation in the way, let's say, that Noah was? Where the rest of us are just going to be wiped out by the curse of death. And Jesus stands as a beacon for a different world that will exist beyond us. What if that's the case? And that's why Paul gives 
the guarantee. So far, he's building his case. The pattern is consistent. The fact has been established, but he needs to give the guarantee. He needs to give the guarantee. So he gives that in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now let's enjoy this incredible logic, okay? Incredible moment that Paul is having here with the Corinthian church and that he's having with us. Paul is saying that the comprehensive promise of death as a result of sin actually indicates how trustworthy God's promises are. It actually indicates how certain you can be of eternal life. Here's what Paul is saying. Every graveyard is a promise of eternal life. Here's how he's doing that. A graveyard is filled with people who were children, if we can use that phrase, children of Adam. And you've never met a person who didn't eventually die. Every generation going before us, they have died. All in Adam died. Why? Well, he already declared it because Adam, because of sin, introduced death into the world. But Christ was not of Adam. That's the significance of the virgin birth. He was of a new line of humanity. And in this person, the comprehensive promise is just as secure as the comprehensive cures. You see the logic Paul's working with? He's saying, how certain are you that someone who belongs only to Adam will die? You could say, very certain. (laughs) Very certain. Absolutely certain. There are no exceptions. How certain are you? He's saying, the reason they have died is because God is faithful to his promise. That sin will bring death. But good news. The same God that is faithful to that promise has made a new promise by the resurrection of Christ. When Adam died, it was an anticipation. The first person on that list to be referenced, as I said in Genesis 5, is Adam. He lived so many years, and he died. And then all of his children followed in his footsteps. God sees that not as an accident or incidental, but as a family trait. And then he says, now there is a new head of humanity. And this new head of humanity also has children, those that belong to him. And they will follow in his footsteps just as surely as all those under Adam followed in his. The family trait will as surely be seen in Christ as it's seen in Adam. So he's saying just as surely as every person who is a human being that belonged to Adam died, and they all did, just that surely all of those who belong to Jesus will live. Just as surely as death is the end of life for those who are living and breathing, children of Adam, just as surely life will come after death for all those who belong to Jesus. God always does what he says he will do. And there will be no exceptions. There will be no exceptions. This is the guarantee. Paul turns death into a guarantee of life. He turns the certainty of death into a certainty of life. He's saying just as certainly as those who are in Adam will die, just that certainly those who are in Christ shall live. When I first moved to Texas about six years ago, the month after I arrived, I got a call that I never expected. One of my friends back in Arizona, a young man about 20 years old, had been killed in a motorcycle accident. About 15 years ago, just after I was married, I got word that an old friend, wonderful young lady that I'd been in church youth group with, grown up with, had died in a tragic accident while expecting her first child. Before that day, I still remember the day I heard my mom scream out from the next room because she had gotten word that my grandfather had suffered a massive heart attack and had died. Death, in all of its tragic certainty, is meant to indicate to us the absolute certainty of God's purposes for mankind. And when Christ rose from the dead, God was declaring with 
absolute certainty that those who belong with him will rise from their graves. My friends who believed in Jesus will just as certainly rise from their graves as they are not breathing right now. They will just as certainly see again, hear again, sing again, walk again, exult in Christ again as they are not now doing so. A graveyard is merely a stairway into the heavenly home of Jesus Christ, where all of his people will certainly be again. God will do what he has declared. He declared in Adam death. He declared in Christ life. When God raised Jesus from the dead, he was declaring to all those who belong to Jesus, this is your future too. Brothers and sisters, this is your future too. This is your future too. You, if you believe in Jesus as your Savior, that he died for your sins, that he took your place on the cross, that he suffered the wrath you deserved, that you claim him as your Lord, as your Savior, that God has reconciled himself to you through the death of Christ, then what happens to Christ will happen to you. Paul's point is that this is an announcement worth an abundance abundant celebration. I, imagine if the world believed this. I mean, just, just ima- imagine that just for a moment. Let's imagine if there could be a newspaper headline, death defeated. Just, just feel that for a second, okay? Death defeated. A way to live forever. World governments agree. The way to live forever has been demonstrably proven. There is irrefutable evidence that there is a life after death that can be guaranteed. A physical life after death. Now, I think the kind of heavenly optimism that we often experience in this country is tinged with a lot of doubt. I think it's more like wishful thinking. It's more like, you know, the bride who says, I'm sure it'll be sunny, uh, you know, when I'm getting my pictures. I'm I'm sure the clouds won't cover the right? It's more like, I hope it'll happen. I I wish it would happen. I really want it to happen. Now's the day of the big game. I, I hope it doesn't get rained out. It's wishful thinking, but it's tinged with doubt because you're not sure. But imagine if there was some way of telling this world you can be Absolutely sure. As sure as anything. More sure you can be sure of this. There is life after death. When you die, you'll merely be falling asleep. And you will wake one day and see the face of the king of the world. And you will live in joy and happiness forever. There is a defeat of death that has taken place. We have found it. Life will exist forever. Death is merely temporary. Rejoice and celebrate. Now you tell me that celebration wouldn't exceed the end of any war. People get excited when they find out cures for individual illnesses that will merely extend life. They get thrilled at a breakthrough that makes it more likely that some people might not be cut down early. They get ecstatic when a brutal war has been brought to a conclusion. There's a time of of peace for a period of time. What would it be like if the world could believe there is permanent life after death and life not of monotony or boredom or (laughs) uselessness, but a living, breathing, robust, joy-filled life without end that would be experienced to the full with all happiness and pain and everything good and nothing of what is evil and sad and detrimental. Imagine if that headline hits the paper. It has. That is what this paper says. That is the news that God intends to unleash the great celebration. This is the news that's meant to be the banner over your life. 
over my life. It's the news, isn't it? Isn't that the news you need this morning? Christ is alive. It's a fact. That fact fits a pattern. It's not an aberration. For by a man came the death that we see. That was not natural. That was an interruption in God's plan of creation. That was an invasion would be a better word. But now there's a reversal of that invasion. And death has been defeated. And we can go back to life forever with our maker. So that death is not different than a falling asleep. And there is a waking that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let's, let's apply this to our lives right now. This truth is meant to surround your worst day with joy. If the war is over, how devastating is a bad tire? If death is over, how devastating is a temporary sickness? And all sicknesses are temporary for Christians. They're brief. They're the briefest of temporary stings. The briefest of temporary pains. This should surround our discomfort with joy. This should motivate and relativize what we want to find joy in right now. You know, sometimes I think Christians, all of us, we act like we haven't gotten this news. We sort of store up joy and spend it on temporary things as if this life is all that there is. As if this is the most joy we can ever hope to experience. And yet, this, this life is this temporary introduction. It's like one of those introductions to a great book that appropriately is very brief. It's short because you want to get to the book. I hate long, long introductions. It's, you want short introductions. Get into the book. Well, that's what this life is. It's the briefest of introductions. C.S. Lewis called it, it's the cover page. It's the cover page that you flip past and you get into the real story in which every chapter is better than the one before. This news should surround our suffering with joy. It should motivate our earthly mindedness with eternal vigor. It should relativize vacations and new purchases and a desire for comfort in this life. None of those things are bad, but they are such a small thing. You wouldn't want to spend everything you have on the cover page, would you? No, it's a cover page. Imagine the author goes to his editor and he's talking about his cover page. And I'm, boy, I think I'm a year away and I, I'm, I'm getting the cover page done. And the editor says, what, what are you talking about? Nobody even reads that. Move on. Move on. Listen, we sometimes act as though we haven't gotten this news. Sometimes we're still rationing for the war when the victory has already been proclaimed. Sometimes we're still thinking about the temporary when the eternal has already been declared. Sometimes we're still thinking about this life when the eternal life has already been demonstrated by the rising of Christ. Listen, don't spend your days editing and re-editing and trying to make the cover page better and better and better and more comfortable and squeeze the most out of retirement and squeeze the most out of vacations and get the most out of my evenings and my weekends and try to make the most I can possibly at my work. No, no, no. There is an eternity coming. Now, what we do here matters for that eternity, but it matters for eternity, not for the cover page of this life. The fact the announcement that should unleash a motivating and comforting joy has been given. On your worst day, you can smile. Jesus is alive. I'm going to be with him. On your most (laughs) lazy day, tempting day, Day battling a focus on inconveniences and cravings for this life. You can remember, Jesus is alive. That is where my joy is found. How does this day relate to that day? How does it relate to the fact that all in Christ shall be made alive? 
this is what motivated Paul. It's what gave him such, such strength and vigor in his, his prayers and his evangelism and his, his obedience and his clinging to Christ and suffering and his godliness because he said, this is the cover page, the story is coming. The story is coming, and I, I want to get into that story. And the best I can do right now is to write an intro that indicates that the story is worth reading. That's the purpose of your life right now. Write an intro that tells this world that story is worth reading. Spend your money in a way that tells this world that story is worth reading. Plan your days in a way that says that story is worth reading. Evaluate, let us, let us evaluate our failures as a way of not showing that the story is worth reading. And let's live in such a way that declares our story, our story with Christ, the story that will go on and on, each chapter better than the one before. That story is worth reading. And let's declare that to our neighbors and our friends and one another. Look, the story is worth reading. This is just the intro. The suffering now, it's preparing you for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Your godliness now, it's declaring that the king that we are living for is worth all glory. Your confessions now are declaring that the worst thing that happens right now to me is my sin. And the best thing that has happened to me is Christ's forgiveness. And my future is secure in spite of my failures because of his death on the cross. That is an intro worth writing every day of our lives. Christ is alive, and in his life, he invites us to enjoy the eternal story that he has written to include us. On one of those gravestones I walked by earlier, I was struck by a familiar poem with a lot more meaning. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now presumably, that dear saint, I'm presuming, but based on her gravestone, I'm presuming, That dear saint's going to wake up seeing Jesus. She's seeing him now, but she'll see him with physical eyes one day. That intro has been written. And I pray her life said the same thing as that gravestone. I pray ours does as well. Life is coming because Christ 